in New York City, oh. there's so many subway systems that don't have an elevator and instead have like stairs on stairs on stairs. Who even likes stairs, bruh? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. My name is Chella Man. And my name is Aaron Rose Phillips. And we have known each other for about five years now and have since grown into ourselves together. In private, we've often held a lot of conversations about what it means to be a disabled, trans, BIPOC artist. We have wanted to bring these conversations we've had in private to the public and candidly dive into our truth. I'm forced to take up this space because you've never seen this black trans joy before. One of my most euphoric experiences was having top surgery. Being a disabled person, a trans person, you're constantly advocating and problem solving. And the truth is, when we are the authors of our own story, be careful what I say because anything could come out. <laughs> no, babe, but let it come out. Nothing is off the table. Today, we are joined by Kay Ulandai Barrett, a New Jersey-based poet, performer and educator who navigates the world as a disabled Filipinx American transgender queer. They're an accomplished writer and were a 2021 Lambda Literary Award finalist for their second book, More Than Organs. Welcome, Kay. Hey, What's hi, up? Corey. Yes. Oh my God, it's about to get so good in here. Hi, Kay. Oh, I'm so, yes, you can. I love how, hi, Kay, how are you? I'm so happy to finally meet you. Oh my God. Yes, thank you y'all for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything. Like, the vibe is immaculate today. You okay. look amazing. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going for the uncle Filipino proletariat exactly. working class. Oh my God. Exactly. You know, a little touch of sparkle is all I need. We're about to really get into some things. Okay, let's yeah, see. I'm ready, okay. Chella and I were literally speaking about this and like, we have never had the opportunity with our careers in media or in fashion to really sit besides ourselves and have a conversation with other trans disabled people. People that intersect in those ways, being trans and physically disabled. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is such a lack of this conversation? And like, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> We're just gonna so look at the camera like, and be like, why? Like, why? 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 There are so many systems in place. The, the trans disabled people I know are struggling to find housing, right? right? Are struggling advocacy in medical care, are in line signing up for Medicaid, are sharing food stamps, are trying to find binders that adequately fit their fat bodies, are trying to get citizenship in a country that rounds up undocumented people. Right? There's so many things keeping us from each other. It's not us. It's the systems in place. So when you're dealing and working through those systems, level after level, you're just tired. Mm -hmm. And so we're further and further away from one another. And that's yeah. why collective care is so critical. That's why reaching out is so critical. I don't want to say like, oh, we have all these same demographics. We are always going to agree. No, 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 no. But we should be able to have bounty together and have these conversations together. There's a reason why we're segregated. There's a reason why we're isolated. I feel like unfortunately also, we, most people don't know all these things. Like coming to New York it enabled me to see all these different systems. Mm -hmm. How do you think, how do you both think that we can bring the conversations of disability justice, collective liberation to a more mainstream audience without diluting the topics at hand? How do we welcome people into these conversations in a way that doesn't unfortunately scare them away, even though that shouldn't be the work that we at all have to think about. Mm -hmm. I say something that's really scary to a lot of able people. We're human. You're going to age. Eventually, you will be disabled. Yeah. This is how the human body works. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about this for a second? Of course. Because this is something I think about all the time, and I'm mm -hmm. so happy you said this, Kate, because it's true. Like, what you think happens when you age, babe? Yeah. You'll become disabled. You're gonna be disabled at some point of your life. Yeah. yeah. But it's their fear, that's why. If they can just push us away or silence us or not realize how much we contribute already. Right. Like, it's, it's a shame, it's really heartbreaking. They're missing out on a part of themselves. And I'm not gonna be there to be like, woo woo, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna be like, welcome. This is the <laughs> welcome. <laughs> it's <Exactly>. hard. <laughs> Today is all about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. As so much of your work itself centers the concept of intersectionality, 
How would you define intersectionality in your own words and own terminology? I mean, first of all, intersectionality was created by black feminists, right? So we have to be clear, yes. 1989, Kambahi River Collective, Kimberly Crenshaw, utilized the word intersectionality to discuss that black people and black women are more than just one or the other, right? So when we're talking about intersectionality in terms of us, you're not just one single issue, as Audre Lorde would put it, right? right? We're whole bodies, whole lives. So intersectionality is, how do we interact with the world? Moreover, how do systems, the state, police, any other place with a bunch of people, treat people based on how we breathe in society? Right. I go to the <laughs> store, they're like, boop, 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 Asian, fat, got a cane. It's not just one of those things, it's like all of it together. And intersectionality honors that and uplifts that. That's a beautiful way of enlightening and explaining what intersectionality is and what it means to you from a personal standpoint. Yeah, I just think that as people were frequently parsed or cut into small pieces, right? Without us right. even choosing. And intersectionality gives us that opportunity to be our full brilliance, to be all the spots that we are. Like for me, being Asian or being working class or being disabled or being trans doesn't not one thing is a priority. They all like hug, kiss, overlap, and they also build a lot of tension because of white abled supremacy. So, so yeah, I mean, we're impacted on so many levels. I have so many questions, but I'm going to <laughs> narrow it down to this one for now. How has disability informed your perspective of collective liberation? I, so like full transparency, I wasn't born physically disabled, right? I had a very able-bodied life until my 20s, until my young 20s. So I feel that collective liberation, you can't just do anything by yourself. Those bootstraps, they will kill us. Like that individualist accomplishment, uh, whatever awards we have, however much money we have, disability justice tells us, actually, that's not your worth. How are you treating yourself and others? Mm -hmm. And I think disability itself has been this gorgeous illumination where I get to not take anyone for granted. I'm in a whole world in the cosmos, their community I don't even know yet, right, who I can marvel, and who've organized, protested, shared their thoughts in ways that still build me. It was kind of like a different kind of transition where I was like, oh, I don't wow. have to be by myself. You're not flawed. You're not. You don't need to be fixed unless that's something you truly desire. What's broken, what's messed up, what reinforces violence are the state and the systems, yes. right? Like, I don't need to move. I don't need to change. It's actually the world, right? Exactly. And so much exactly. of the world is actually pretty disabled and pretty sick and pretty blind and deaf and neurodivergent. We're told that we're supposed to be put away or isolated or undesirable. And that's just a sham, friends. Like, that's the biggest lie there ever was. <laughs>and chatted on the streets of NYC to everyone about intersectionality, and I got a little clip I want to show y'all. Production, please play it. It's giving business, it's giving Wall Street, it's giving everything, like, I feel like I'm about to make a deal, baby. Mwah. <laughs> Most people don't know what it's like to be trans, or what it's like to be black, and definitely don't know what it's like to be disabled. So, I'm rolling around in Washington Square Park, asking people to say the quiet part out loud for once. So come follow me, babe. Let's go chat with everyone. Hello, darling. Hi, darling. Hello <laughs> there. Tell me, in the most objective way you possibly can, what is the first thing you notice about me? Your clothes, to be honest, because I looked over and I saw your suit and I was like, Wow, my first thing I noticed was your, your eyeliner. It's gorgeous. Oh my god, thank you <laughs> so much. And then, of course, I noticed the wheelchair. Then I noticed the shoes, right? And Wait. so it was in that order. <laughs> yes! Wait, I, I love that. Lie. I noticed you're in a wheelchair. And also, you look very dapper today, very... Why? Thank you. I tried my best. Clearly, I knew you are in a wheelchair, but what was more noticeable to me was just your presence and you, you know, and how you were smiling and laughing and I noticed right off the bat. Do you happen to know any disabled people that are of the LGBTQ community? I, I wouldn't know any. Have to think about that. I do not. That's a good question. You're making me think why. And I can't, answer, so I can't, I'm and I can't answer that. That's what yeah. I'm going to do, make you yeah. think, make your brain you know? turn, you know? Yeah. 
how would you personally define what intersectionality means to you? That's a great question. I've heard the term. I personally don't know like a definition for it. I don't really know how to define that term because I'm a little bit older and I'm a little bit more of like just a, a simple gay man. That is And that's valid. what you're teaching me. You will teach me exactly what that <laughs> I'm means. I'm so glad I'm able to teach you something. <laughs> I mean, when I think of intersectionality, I think I'm going into the mental health wellness field. So I think of the importance of having health professionals that look like us, that share our identities, our experiences, our intersections of being. For me, for example, I'm like a black woman, right? Yeah. I'm not just black and I'm not just a woman. So like when people want me to join like social causes or like those marches for women go on, I'm not just a woman before being black, or I'm not just bisexual before being black, or bisexual before being a woman, right? It's all together, all at once. That's brilliant, babe. What is one thing about you that the world says holds you back, but, but you know to be your own superpower? I'm really stubborn. Like, if I believe in something, I'm, I'm believing it. You're gonna yeah. know I'm believing in it. People say I'm personally really quiet. But I'm not quiet, I'm just observing. Uh, being someone who has mental illness, I think it makes me stronger because I will understand a lot of what my clients are going through. Society has told me that being gay is wrong, you know, and actually that is my superpower. I would say one of the biggest issues in my life right now is the dysphoria that really clouds my head. But to me, I feel the fact that I'm able to keep walking in the world the way I want to. Yes, please. And have all these plans to make my life better and achieve what I want to achieve. I feel like that makes me powerful. That's our superpower now, is just to keep being strong and keep going. You know, we have done things in my generations for the LGBT community today, what we yes, have. Absolutely. And now your generation is teaching me. You're teaching me a lot. You really are. Oh, thank you know, we all gotta keep growing and teaching each other. And thank no matter what generation, we still are learning that we have to continue to fight. I think that generational wealth is real and I'm yeah. feeling the generational wealth and the connection right now and I want to thank Aww. you so much. For Can I give you a hug? Yes, yeah, so please, please do. Oh, You're thank awesome. you so You're much. So thank awesome. you. It was so nice talking to oh, you. Oh, love. Can I please give you a huge hug? Of course. Oh, my god. You're brilliant, gosh. love. Oh, Basically, me. you a real one. <laughs>
So that's what I worry about. Like, when can we actually just see our selves for who we aren't on paper, mm -hmm. but for our humanity. For me, it's like I'm trying to find other trans disabled people. I'm trying to uplift <clears throat> us because once that happens, when we center each other, there's no way we can really be erased. Right. You know what I'm saying? What do the both of you think are the biggest misconceptions people will have in general about disabled people and our experiences. That we want to be like them. That being able is normal and better and superior mm -hmm. and more desirable. And I don't really want to be abled at all. Oh, disabled know? people are sexy. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's get into it. Exactly. <laughs> what happens if we're just like, oh, what we are is enough? We're content. Yeah. We're so content. Yeah, with what's we the are. problem? The problem mm -hmm. is the lack of resources for us to be content. You know, I just think about the fact that, like, in New York City, oh. there's so many subway systems that don't have an elevator and instead have, like, stairs on stairs on stairs. Who even likes stairs, bruh? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. No. Why are you taking stairs? It's so clear as day. Why are you taking stairs where you take an elevator and everyone can use the elevator and y'all yeah. can only take stairs? Mm -hmm. We expand our disability. It's like moms with baby carriages needs, you know, need elevators. Elderly folks need elevators. People carrying a bunch of shit. And that's not to equalize our needs. Right. But our needs are all just as valid. Before you have to go, can we please drop a little question that we got from a little human on the street for you? Of course, yes, please. Okay, amazing. Let's roll that. As a person of color and as somebody who is queer, um, my question would be how can these intersectional traits be beneficial in our day-to-day -day conversations and day-to-day -day interactions with people, um, even when we live in a society that maybe taught us the opposite, or maybe like taught us that these things were negative or these things are what holds us back, when really these things are what brings us forward and makes us us. You have to talk about who you are in day-to-day -day conversation, otherwise, you won't be heard or seen for who you are. And you hold that power within yourself to make yourself and your presence known. Owning yourself and being able to have conversations about yourself to people that enter your life is so crucial because they ask to be there. I just feel like you miss out on such exuberance. You miss out on, on someone if you're just parsing them. Right. Like, I'm not a filter, you're not a filter. And witnessing who we are in our full selves, in our full, as Eli Claire would say, body minds, right. um, that means that there's not one part that's edited, mm -hmm. right? right? It's We're being our most true, honest selves towards justice. Mm -hmm. You cannot find justice or liberation. You can't feed everyone and take care of everyone if we're pretending. So in those intersections, you're being your most honest self. And hopefully, that vibration goes out with everyone else who's being their most honest selves, mm. right? I love that. I think that living at these intersections also encourages all of us to know ourselves so deeply because we live in a world that bombards us with questions about who we are, that we're almost forced to do labor to understand who we are at our very core. But I think everyone should do that work because how, how beautiful it is to live a life where you know what you want and you know who you are. And know your value, right? Like it's not just face value of what other people are giving you, mm -hmm. but actually you know exactly what you demand. Mm -hmm. You understand the value of yourself, but also the value of the collective. Okay, thank you immensely for your time and for your contribution to literally the entire world. <laughs> in your work and in this conversation and beyond. And within your existence as who you are as a person. Deciding every day to get up and be yourself in a world that isn't even made for you and doing it with such candor mm. and wit and, conf and you know, that conversational vibe that I love. <laughs> you're such a cool man. You're, you're, you're like everything. Like, you're, 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 you're so good. Like, yeah, thank you. I just feel thank like you. we always were. Trans and disabled people have always been. Thank you for sharing your time and your spoons, if you use them, <laughs> with me.